I was always the weird kid growing up, so making friends was never easy for me. I was a bit of a punk in high school, so living in a preppy religious town was torture. Eventually I met this boy, Sean. I was so happy to finally have someone I connected with. We quickly became best friends and hung out nearly every day. He was odd, but so was I, so I just looked past it. Most of the time when we were hanging out, we were also on drugs, so I figured some of the stuff he was saying was just that talking, but one day he said, I'm going to stab someone this week. Four days later, he made threats towards the school on our Instagram. He played it off as a joke when I confronted him about it, but when the school confronted him, they took it much more seriously. He was taken into custody by police, but not charged with anything somehow. His parents took away his phone and forced him to move away for a few weeks to let the air clear, but we kept in contact. At this point, my dumb self realized I was in love with him. I did everything I could to clear his name. I even got into arguments with my parents on Facebook. My parents begged me to stop talking to him, but for some reason, I truly believed he was good. I didn't want to believe he was capable of hurting anyone. The whole situation never really blew over. When he came back to school, students would run from him in the hallways. People were sending him threats and his reputation was ruined. After all of this, something in him changed. He was angrier. We would be talking and joking about something and he would start attacking me with words. I'd tell him about a boy I was talking to and he'd call me all sorts of names. Or if I made a new friend, he'd go out of his way to ruin my new friendship. And for some reason, I saw this as him being protective. About a year went by after this. The verbal abuse continued and I continued to do nothing about it. I was still in love with him, but I didn't act on it since he was my closest friend. And to keep my mind off of Sean, I started dating a boy named Alex. Sean hated Alex. Not for any particular reason, he just didn't like that I spent time with someone that wasn't him. Alex was also a dealer and Sean knew this. Sean asked Alex if he would front him some since he knew we were best friends, and Alex did. I don't remember the exact amount, but it was a decent amount, enough to be mad about it when you don't get paid for it. Sean never paid Alex. Alex tried to talk to him about it, and Sean always put him off and avoided him. After a month of this, Alex saw Sean's car in a Taco Bell parking lot and pulled up. He saw Sean in his car and began to get out. Since Alex had anger issues, he also pulled out his baseball bat. Sean saw him and freaked out. He pulled out of his parking spot quickly, drove off and called 911, calling it a deal gone wrong. Alex was then arrested for assault with a deadly weapon. Three days later when Alex got out of jail, he was driving to his friend's house who lives in Sean's neighborhood. When he saw Sean standing in his front yard, Alex rolled down his window, yelled some stuff and drove away. Sean called the police again, and Alex was arrested for stalking this time. And around this time, my parents caught me smoking. I didn't want to lie anymore, so I was honest and told my parents everything. Obviously, they were very mad at me for getting myself into the situation, and I had just told them I was smoking and dating a dealer, so I was in a decent amount of trouble. My parents took my phone as soon as I got home from school. I wasn't allowed to see Alex when he got out of jail. They took my paycheck so that I didn't have money to buy anything, and they made me download a tracker on my phone so they could make sure that I wasn't home when they weren't. They contemplated calling Sean's parents and telling them how we had been smoking together. I knew that if Sean got caught smoking, he would get kicked out of his house, so I snuck my phone and texted them that my parents might call his parents, and he was mad. He called me horrible names and said he wished that he had never met me. I finally had enough and told him not to talk to me anymore. My parents never called his parents. We didn't talk at all. I asked not to be scheduled with him at work and avoided him at school. We didn't have any classes together so it wasn't hard but hearing the stuff he'd say about me made it a little difficult. He made rumors that I was addicted to things and that I was selling images of myself online. And this is when the text started. He began texting me constantly so I blocked his number. Then he'd use someone else's phone to text me, so I'd block that person's number. Then he'd use WhatsApp or GroupMe to text me since we'd use those for work, so I'd just block him on there. 
He eventually got fired from our job because he had been writing tips on receipts if people didn't ask for a copy of their receipt and left the tip line empty. The continuous messages went on for a few weeks and I just continued to block anyone he was associated with. I didn't want to be in contact with him whatsoever. He kept making new Instagram accounts to message me on and all of his attempts to contact me failed. One day I had a late lesson at School of Rock where I took guitar lessons. My teacher had stayed late for me so I was expecting his car to be the only car in the parking lot, but it wasn't. There were two cars in the parking lot, my teacher's and Sean's. To this day I don't know how he knew I was going to be there. I quickly parked, locked my doors, and thought about what to do. I then realized he wasn't in his car so I calmed down a bit and called inside to ask if he was there, but he wasn't. I cautiously got out of my car and got my guitar, then walked inside with no problems. After my lesson, I came out to see that he was now parked right next to me, waiting for me to get into the car. When he saw me, he began screaming profanities at me. I was paralyzed. He just sat there, screaming at me. I quickly climbed in my car from the passenger door so I didn't have to walk next to him, and then drove home as fast as I could. He began asking people to ask me to talk to him at school. Of course I didn't. Each time someone mentioned his name to me, it caused me to have a panic attack so bad I'd have to leave school. I ended up missing the entire month of November and then switching to online school. A month after I switched to online school, I was driving with a friend to pick up food from my mom. As soon as we pulled into the drive through the car behind me begins to flash the brights at me. I look in my rearview mirror and see Sean's car. He has a sticker across the top of his windshield, so I knew it was him right away. I look over at my friend in fear and she said, I didn't want to scare you, so I didn't say anything, but he's been following us since we left Target. I panic and just pretend not to notice him. He then pulled out of the drive through and parked right next to it by the exit. As soon as he pulled out, so did I. I sped to my friend's house, dropped her off, and went straight home. At this point, my parents thought going to the police would be the smartest thing to do. An officer came to my house and took a statement. I showed him screenshots of every message he had sent me over the months, and my friend that was in the car with me in the drive through talked to him as well. We decided not to press charges, but to just file an instant report. Days go by, and I don't hear anything from him. I thought that maybe it was over and that I could move on with my life, but my dad told me Sean had messaged him on Facebook. He had said I was addicted to pills and that I stole money from him to buy more. I'd never done pills in my life. I'm a hippie. I stick to natural things. My parents know this, so they screenshot the messages and send them to police. The police go by his house and tell him to stop contacting me. I continued to get messages from random Instagram accounts and sometimes saw his car behind me, but each time I just wrote down the location, date, and time I saw him. At this point, I started to work with Alex's lawyers to prove that Sean wasn't an innocent victim. Eventually, Alex's charges were dropped. Sean was proven to be unreliable since I came forward with my story. I wish I could say I had an ending to this story, but I don't. I still get random messages, but I don't bother to screenshot them anymore. Since I switched to online school, I was able to graduate a year early, and because of that, I moved away for college, so I don't have to worry about him following me anymore. The last I heard about him was that he got arrested a few months ago. It was Christmas time. My wife and I were staying at her childhood home where her mother now lived all alone. Well, not if you include the cats. The house was a quiet cul-de-sac in the suburbs. If you're Picturing freshly mowed lawns, American flags, and empty sidewalks, you're picturing it right. It's a single-story home with an attached garage out front. The garage has two doorways, apart from the electric garage door, of course. One leads to the garden and backyard. This is an old doggy door from their days with dear old Max, rest in peace Max, that they covered with a piece of nail and wood. That had always made me slightly uncomfortable before, but... I figured it had been that way for years, so what's the worst that could happen? The second door leads to the kitchen. Hollow core. It could stop a mouse, but not much else. Definitely not something that wanted in. Or someone. 
We were asleep in my wife's childhood and bedroom at the front of the house. 3 a.m. I was in that deep, dark recess of sleep. You know, you're in the diving bell, and you're submerged hundreds of meters below the surface in black water, protected from the real world by miles of nothingness. Then I heard it. The scream. What are you doing? It was my mother-in-law's voice echoing down the hallway. To me, lost in a sea of sleep, it sounded like a jet engine roaring past my eardrum. I bolted up. What happened next happened in a matter of seconds. But about that scream, even though I was dead asleep, I heard enough of it to sense an urgency behind it. This wasn't an, oh you scared me type of scream. This was different, and I knew it. Not consciously, but my lizard brain, that piece we retained from our primitive ancestors, knew something was wrong. I watched and read a fair amount of true crime and this scream awakened that horrible fear. The one that says, this can't really be happening to me, can it? Honestly, in that second of the night, it sounded like someone was about to be murdered. You ever wondered if you're a fight or flight type of individual? I always have and I came to know something about myself after that night. I'm a fighter. I leaped out of bed, growled, yes, growled in the manliest voice I could muster. I'm coming for you, and took off running. I tore open the bedroom door and ran into the hallway. There at the end I saw my mother-in-law, nightgown on, look of utter shock on her face, standing still. We'd make eye contact as I continued toward her. Then she turns her head, looks directly into the kitchen. I hurry past her and round the corner into the kitchen. The hollow cord door is obliterated, shards everywhere. I look through the open frame and see the electric garage door is open. I push ahead. As I run into the garage, I hear it. The sound of someone hopping into a running car just out of view. Just as I make it onto the driveway, I see a car peeling out from the sidewalk adjacent to the house. But the adrenaline is still pumping. And who am I to say no to adrenaline? So like an idiot, I run, barefoot, after the car. I give a good go, but I'm no Michael Johnson, and even he couldn't catch a speeding car. It soon vanishes down the street, and I'm left all alone. The police showed up within three minutes, which, I have to say, makes me feel a lot more at ease with my mother-in-law living there. They took our statements. My mother-in-law said she heard a noise, the hollow cord door being kicked in, and walked into the kitchen where she encountered the burglar, a small framed woman. The police theorized she was working as part of a team. Her job was to squeeze through the doggy door, kicking in the hollow core and open the electric garage door for her accomplice. According to the police, the burglars most likely thought nobody was home. Fortunately, my mother-in-law must have caught her off guard and scared her, in addition to my manly growl, of course. But it feels good to know that everyone was safe and to learn that I guess I've got a little fight in me. And for the record... We bought the heaviest wooden door you've ever seen to replace that hollow core. I'd like to see a mouse try and get through that. So I had a best friend in high school named Lena. We were friends for about a year and a half and we would spend almost every weekend at her house listening to music, watching scary movies and gossiping. She was just a little bit crazy, the type of girl to beat up her boyfriend's exes unprovoked. She actually did that once, and catfish people. I say we were best friends, but actually it was more like I looked up to her and she liked that she could boss me around and hang out with me whenever she pleased. She was extremely manipulative and two-faced. She had a hobby of being nice to girls at school and then going on their social media and making fun of everything they posted. She would befriend people just to get information from them. When we were friends, Lena was dating this guy named Nolan. They dated for about a year and a half and had lots of troubles the last six months or so. He would go out drinking most weekends and she would cry in the middle of the night and blow up his phone, yelling at him and making him feel guilty. She was borderline psychotic when it came to his exes or the girls he was friends with, and they just weren't really working out, but they stayed together anyways. At some point, Nolan got Lena pregnant, and one of Lena's other friends, whose name was Autumn, became pregnant at the same time from the guy I was in love with. Naturally, I wanted nothing to do with Autumn, 
but because they were pregnant together, Lena started hanging out with Autumn most weekends and neglected our friendship. After about a month, I became fed up with it and started ghosting her. At first she tried to apologize, but I was not having it, since the other girl was dating the guy I had been in love with for two years, and I was jealous and childish. So eventually Lena got angry at me and stopped trying. A few months went by and Lena had the baby. Nolan and Lena stayed together to take care of their son, but their relationship was absolutely horrendous at that point. Lena cheated on him and Nolan decided he wanted out of the relationship but continued to see his son and buy things for him. However, Lena and Lena's mother made things very difficult for him by constantly changing the days he could see his son and refusing to let him take his son anywhere besides Lena's house. Lena's mother would also throw out Christmas presents from Nolan, ignore his phone calls and eventually told him he wasn't allowed at the house. Nolan begged for months to see his son, but it was clear Lena and her mother didn't want him in the picture. Nolan offered to pay child support, but they didn't want that either. They just wanted him gone, so he stopped trying. And apparently even that wasn't what they wanted. Lena took to social media to talk about how Nolan was a deadbeat. She told everyone she knew that being a single mother was really hard, and the baby daddy refused to take care of his kid. A year after they broke up, I met Nolan in person. We had been talking online for a couple of months about Lena. We had shared stories about her crazy meltdowns and her manipulative tendencies, and we talked about the time he came to her house while I was there and attempted to scare her by jumping out when she went out the front door, but instead actually jumped out at me. He thought it was the funniest thing ever that my face stayed stone cold, and I just said, Sup. We had a similar sense of humor, and at the time, I had no one. I had just come out of one of the worst depressive episodes of my life. It had lasted for a good year, and I had dropped out of school, been doing drugs, isolating myself for weeks at a time, and considered ending my life. He was the one to help bring me back from the brink. He was kind, and he was my support system. We were just friends at first. When Lena caught wind of our friendship, she reached out to me. At this point, we hadn't been friends for a year and a half. We caught up and talked about what had been happening in our lives. She asked what was going on with Nolan and I told her we were just friends. Everything seemed fine. That's when her erratic behavior started. She would randomly block me on social media and then unblock me a month or two later. Sometimes we would talk like, how are you? Everything good? And then the next day I'm blocked. At one point I asked one of her friends to get her to tell me why she was doing it because I was confused. So she unblocked me and told me she was salty about the situation with Nolan and the fact that I was friendly with him. I asked her why she kept making up with me and then suddenly getting angry again and cutting me off. I told her I was tired of thinking things were good only for her to turn around and pretend like we had never said anything to each other. That's when she said she could block me again or keep me unblocked. Whatever I wanted was fine but she felt I had done her wrong by abandoning her during her pregnancy and befriended her ex-boyfriend. So then I tried to explain to her why Nolan was my friend. I tried to tell her that Nolan was all I had in the darkest time of my life. I tried to tell her why her neglecting me for Autumn hurt my feelings, but she wasn't having it. I understand where she was coming from, I do, and I acknowledge the fact that I acted childishly and in a cruel way, but I tried to make up with her multiple times. I tried really hard and she couldn't even stick with whether she could forgive me or not, so I told her to block me again and be done with it. She told me she wouldn't block me again and then gave me her blessing with Nolan. She said she was fine if we wanted to date and she said she hoped I had a good life and I said the same to her and I really meant it. We had a bad end but I was glad we could at least wish each other well. It was a few months after I last spoke to her that Nolan and I started dating. I had waited so long because I was worried about Lena, even though we weren't friends anymore, but she had given me her blessing and she was dating someone new so I went with it. It was around this time that I received a friend request from a girl on Facebook named Casey. Casey said that she lived in a big city in my state, and since we had mutual friends and I had once gone to school in that city, I assumed we had gone to school together and I just didn't remember her. She seemed like a real person. She claimed to work at a Hooters, had made posts about how her work days went, had several pictures of the same girl and made frequent posts about her ex-boyfriend. 
I accepted the friend request, and she messaged me telling how pretty she thought I was. I thanked her and told her to message me anytime she wanted to chat. For the next few months, I was clueless. I went about my regular life posting about the things me and Nolan did, getting my GED, hanging out with friends, visiting my mother, etc. Occasionally, I would see strange posts on my timeline from Casey, but didn't think much about it because I had over a thousand friends on Facebook and I rarely saw them. They were mostly posts about how much she hated her baby daddy and how her line of work sucked, but there were two posts in particular that caught my eye. One was a post that seemed to be referencing something I had posted the day before, and the other was her verse saying, We all know a dirty scoundrel named blank, with my first name in the blank. I went to her profile and then clicked through months and months of posts, somewhere about her line of work. Everything else was related to me and Nolan. Everything. There were posts of her complaining about her deadbeat baby daddy buying things for everyone but his kid. Posts about how sad she felt about the breakup. Posts about how she missed me and thought of me as a sister, which is nonsense. Posts about how I stole her boyfriend, also nonsense. And a myriad of posts talking trash on me. She made fun of my hobbies, had directly referenced some of my posts, talked about how much she hated me, said how dirty I was, and, and in her later posts even went so far as to put my initials or full first name in the post. She even had people in the comments egging her on and talking trash too, even though no one knew who she was talking about. But I did. She mentioned things only the two of us knew. She referenced our past experiences, and it was undoubtedly Lena. I messaged Casey and told her I knew it was Lena. She played dumb and told me the initials were of another girl she knew. When I looked up the name she gave me, not a single person on Facebook had that name. When I told her that, she brushed over it and tried to get me to talk about Lena. So I played along and talked hardcore trash about Lena. I lied about a lot of the things in an attempt to get her to out herself. But in the end, all she did was send a screenshot of our conversation to Lena's account in an attempt to make it look like Casey was real and was trying to help Lena out by showing what kind of person I was. Casey then immediately deleted her account. She didn't block me. She deleted it. I had a friend and my dad check and neither of them could find Casey's profile. So then another month went by and I found out that she had reactivated the account and because I can't block a deleted account she was in my friends list again and had access to my profile for who knows how many days so I blocked her. She then sent me friend and follow requests on three other websites under the Casey name which I also blocked. It was around that time that me and Nolan began to get a lot of friend requests from obviously fake accounts. We would report them and block them and try to pretend she wasn't going insane. One of these fake accounts was extremely obvious because it had poked both me and Nolan on the same day at the same time. She was taunting us, I guess. I blocked that account too. Now please be aware that at this time, Lena had married her boyfriend. She was doing this while married to someone else. A year later I thought it had stopped and one day I went to the Casey account on my friend's Facebook because I wanted to see if she was still posting about me and when I scrolled down I realized I had missed a post last time. This post was Lena mocking the fact that my mother, my birth mother, called her frequently to talk trash about me and give her information on me and Nolan. Turns out my mother and Lena went to the same college and my mother thought what better way to make friends than by helping someone stalk my daughter. She would ask me about mine and Nolan's relationship often. She would talk trash about Lena and would act like the perfect mother to my face. She didn't raise me so I didn't trust her 100%. For that reason, I never gave her my phone number, address, or any other information I felt was private. When my dog went missing, she tried to convince me to post my address on Facebook. She kept saying how important it was that people know exactly where he went missing from. It's insane. Thank God I didn't because... I might have woken up to Lena punching my head in, or worse. For a while, I was legitimately paranoid. Every time I went to the store or went outside, I was watching my surroundings closely. Because if Lena was willing to beat up a girl Nolan had dated for three weeks, unprovoked, what would she do to me if she saw me in public? I had never met someone so obsessive. Let me just say Lena was a horrible friend. 
She was manipulative, bossy, judgmental, rude, erratic, narcissistic, and two-faced. When I felt my first heartbreak, she spent all night talking trash about this guy, saying I deserve better. Eventually, I joined in with her to make myself feel better, and what does she do? She messages him on Facebook and tells him everything I said about him. She guilt-tripped me about having other friends. She convinced me to abandon one of my friends just because she didn't approve of her. She would ignore me when there were other people around. If I complained about anyone, she would go tell that person what I said, even if she had said something worse about them. She would go through people's Facebooks and laugh at them and talk about how dorky they were, and not in a nice way. In a, this person is scum for being a bit dorky kind of way. She would make me feel ridiculous for liking things I did and I never felt like I could be myself around her. It amazes me how many people Lena had manipulated. Even her poor husband probably doesn't know she was a stalker. And there you have it. Lena cyber-stalked me for two years, and if I had given my mother my address, it might have become actual stalking. She hasn't been trying to stalk me for a while now. I cut my mother off and deleted all but 40 people off my Facebook and made all my social media accounts private to keep this from happening again. I'm hoping I won't ever hear from Lena again. The last obvious thing I've gotten of her still trying to stalk me is a fake account that sent me a friend request about three months ago. An account that was a few months old had the same last name as my friend, who told me he didn't know her, and only liked two Facebook pages, one of which was a grocery store page and the other was my page, my obscure Facebook page. My page that has spaces in between the letters and Japanese letters in the name. My page that you have to either know the exact name of or have a link to find. My page that I had already had to ban Lena and Casey from because both accounts liked it. Sometimes I wonder if Lena is even trying to be secretive, or if she's just stupid. My mom was a horrible addict. She barely took care of me as a kid. At the time of this incident, I was around six or seven, so my awareness and understanding of things happening may not totally make much sense. This happened in the 90s. One night, my mother and I were on a car ride. I wasn't sure why we were driving, but it was late at night. I'm not sure what time it was, but I assume it was really late because there weren't many cars in the street and I was sleeping in the back seat. I don't even remember getting in the car. My mom drove up to some sketchy house and left me in the car for what felt like forever. Suddenly the car door swung open, someone violently grabbed me by my arm and yanked me out of the car. I started screaming and crying until the man that grabbed me looked me in the eyes and said, Be quiet and don't try to run. He had a scruffy beard and looked like a madman. I was scared to death so I listened. He held me tight by my arm, shut the car door and walked with me down the street. I looked back at the house my mom was in, hoping that my mom would come out the last second and save me. I looked at the house as long as I could as the man dragged me further and further away. As we walked down the street, I wanted to cry, but I was in shock and in fear. I didn't know what to do. If I sniffled or cried, the man would tighten his grip and yell at me. I can't even explain how scared and confused I was. We walked for a little while and ended up in the projects. The projects were a bunch of buildings crammed together in a terrible neighborhood. We walked into one of the buildings and walked up a flight of stairs. My legs and feet hurt terribly, but I was too scared to stop moving or complain. I walked up another flight of stairs when I saw some random guy smoking a cigarette in the stairway. Then, without warning, the guy that kidnapped me fell to the ground. It happened so fast. I didn't know how the kidnapper fell to the ground so fast, but the next thing I remember is the cigarette guy was punching and kicking the kidnapper in his head and face. The kidnapper was out cold. Cigarette guy picked up the kidnapper by the back of his jacket and threw him down the stairs. I have no idea how scary and violent it is to see an unconscious man fall down the stairs. To this day, I still have a fear of falling down stairs. He bled everywhere. I still have no idea how Cigarette Guy knew to help me, but I'm glad he did. Maybe he could see the tears in my eyes. Maybe he just picked up on something and had a bad vibe, but he acted instantly. The first second he could, he attacked my would-be kidnapper. Cigarette Guy starts pacing back and forth, swearing at himself, gritting his teeth and clenching his fists. 
I thought he was mad at me, so I started to cry. He looked at me and said, Okay, 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 sh- shut up, shut up. He had an attitude, so I listened to him out of fear. I wasn't as scared of cigarette guy as much as the bearded guy, but I was still in fear of him. He started to ask me questions with an attitude. Why are you out this late? Where are your parents? Why would you talk to strangers? I was in so much shock and confusion I couldn't answer the man's questions correctly. He asked if I knew my way home and I told him I didn't. I told him a broken story about what happened and somehow with the information I gave him, he knew where my mom's car was. The only thing I remember about the road is passing a house with Christmas lights on, despite Christmas already being over. I think he knew the area well enough and figured out where I needed to go from that information, but I honestly don't even remember telling him about the Christmas lights. He told me he would take me back if I promised over and over that I wouldn't tell the police that I saw him or anyone that looked like him and made me promise that I wouldn't even tell the police anything. He had an attitude, I didn't care what he asked me, I just wanted to get back to my mom, so I agreed. I followed him down the stairs. The bearded guy was still laying on the ground bleeding at the bottom of the stairs that cigarette guy threw him down. He wasn't moving at all. For all I know, he was dead, and I hope now that he was. Cigarette guy stepped over the bearded guy and I followed. We walked outside and cigarette guy looked around panicky. I remember him telling me, the police don't like me. We walked out of the projects and my feet still hurt. Cigarette guy was walking fast in a panic and I had to basically jog to keep up with him. I started crying and he was asking what was wrong. I told him my feet hurt and I remember him sucking his teeth and picking me up with an attitude. He awkwardly cradled me in both arms. He walked down the road for a moment. Then I remember him swearing and running behind a house or a building. A cop car was driving down the road, and he put me down and told me to run to the police car. I tried to run, but my legs could barely move, and I was scared. The cop car kept driving and rode away without seeing me before I could even get remotely close to it. He kept swearing to himself as he picked me up again and ran down the street. He took me behind a lot of houses and hid from every cop car that drove by. I assume now that the police were looking for me. He carried me in both arms, running fast down the road when I saw my mom's car in the distance. She was surrounded by police. Cigarette guy put me down and told me to run to the police. I got so excited the pain in my legs disappeared. He put me down and ran away. I ran towards the police and my mom. My mom picked me up and hugged me tight. The police started to ask me and my mom questions. I don't remember too much about their questions, but I remember my mom telling the police some convoluted story that just didn't make any sense. She basically told me not to say anything, and I didn't say much, but cried a whole bunch. We went home. Days later, my dad picked me up and knew something was wrong. I told him everything. I never lived with my mom again. When I grew up and had time to think about that day, I never forgave my mother. Not too long ago, I asked my dad what he remembers about the situation, and he told me what he thinks happened from what I explained to him years ago. He said my mom was on a binge. I got kidnapped. Someone saved me, but the person that saved me had warrants and wasn't mad at me. He just was frustrated with the situation that he had to deal with. Imagine being a criminal on the run, and now you have a kidnapped girl with you, and you just beat a guy up half to death. If he would have gotten caught with me... He could be in jail for my kidnapping. With my mom lying and me being in shock and confused, I wouldn't be able to tell them that the man helped me because it was all happening. I didn't even notice he was helping me. To the man that saved me, thank you. And to the man that tried to kidnap me, I hope you're still laying at the bottom of those stairs. I believe this happened in 6th grade. It's hard for me to believe that this took place 20 years ago. One thing I don't remember is what our science project was exactly. All I know is that I got partnered up with this Mexican kid in my class named Brian. He seemed like a chill kid at school. He was chubby, quiet, and kind of shy. When I went to his house to work on a project for the first time, he apparently was much more comfortable and seemed to be very outgoing. He made jokes and laughed a lot more than usual. He kept saying stuff to his mom in Spanish, and then they would both laugh at me. But I never thought that it was really mean and I would laugh along, even though I didn't know what they were saying. 
Usually right afterwards he would tell me what they had supposedly said. At one point we were in his room and he asked me to go ask his mom for line paper. I told him I didn't speak Spanish and he should go ask her, but he said he would just tell me how to say it. I don't remember exactly, but he told me to say something like, ¿Dónde está el papa la baño? So I went and asked his mom. I knew something was off right away just by the way she looked at me like I had said something crazy. She grabbed my hand and walked me to the bathroom like I was a special little boy. Once we were in the bathroom, she pointed to the toilet paper with a confused look still in her face as if to say, where else would it be? I was confused and could only speak to her in English while she spoke to me in Spanish and we didn't understand each other. Soon we heard Brian having a hilarious laughing fit from the other room. Laughing so hard like he thought it was the funniest thing ever, but I was pretty sure it was only kind of funny. I wasn't worried though and I laughed it off. <laughs> you got me, I thought. Eventually he became really excited to show me something. He told me he'd be right back and then he ran out of his room. He was gone for a minute or so and then returned, telling me to follow him. He was so sure that I was going to love whatever it is he was about to show me, so I was excited too. Couldn't wait. We got outside. He goes to this little shed and pulls out a lawnmower. He tells me to follow him. He started the mower, began walking, and then gestured with his hand again for me to follow him. As we walked, we rounded a corner and there on the ground was a nest full of frogs. There was maybe 20 or more frogs in there. I didn't have time to stop him. Right before it happened, we looked at each other, him looking at me to make sure I was looking, and me looking at him in pure confusion. He pulled back on the mower, raising the blades, then letting the weight of the spinning blades fall down on the writhing pile of frogs. The mower bogged down for just a split second, and there was a sickening wet crunching sound, followed by chunks being spit everywhere as he raised the blades back up. He raised the blades and let them fall on the pile of frogs four or five times, all the while he was staring at my face and laughing maniacally at my horrified reaction. He released the bar and the mower went silent as he crumpled to the ground and began rolling around in the grass, laughing. A couple frogs escaped without getting blended, a few more frantically scattered away from the mower, missing limbs. I awkwardly laughed with him and played along like nothing bad had just happened. I never get disgusted to the point of throwing up and it's hard to disgust me at all, but from that point on I definitely knew that there was something wrong with Brian. Until now I've never told anyone. I wouldn't say that I was afraid, it was just that I didn't think it was a good idea to tell anybody what had happened. Not his mom, not my friends, not my parents, not my brother, not my sister, not my best friend. I didn't tell anybody anything about it and Brian never did anything like that or mentioned it again. It was the weirdest thing. And they say it's the quiet ones you gotta watch out for. I haven't seen him since sixth grade ended but sometimes I wonder just what kind of person he turned out to be. When I was 10 years old, I lived in a relatively small town in Texas in a small house with my mom. My mom has always had a very caring heart for those in need, so when my uncle called her one night and told her he ran into a homeless girl at the local park, my mom offered to help her out for a day or so just to get her back on her feet, that sort of thing. When the girl arrived at my house, she said her name was Laura. Laura told us she was 16 at the time. She seemed like a shy girl. When my mother asked what she was doing out in the streets, Laura told us that she had been kicked out of her home by her mom because her mom had accused her of sleeping with the mom's boyfriend. Laura told us that allegation wasn't true. She told us her mother's boyfriend was the one that came on to her. My mom gave Laura a place to sleep in the guest bedroom that night. The next day, after breakfast, Laura asked us to use my mom's house phone to call her mom to see if she could get some of her things from her mom's house. Laura's mom never answered the phone and we felt bad for her. As a 10 year old girl I couldn't imagine what she must have been going through. Later that day I remember watching TV in the living room and minding my own business but I could feel someone staring at me so I turned my head where I felt the gaze. Laura was sending me a glare so cold that if looks could kill I would have dropped dead. I was confused and a little startled. 
I turned my head away from her quickly and went back to watching TV, but I could still feel Laura's cold gaze. I couldn't understand what I had done to her to cause her to look at me with such hate. The next day, it happened once more. I was in the kitchen getting a glass of water when I could feel someone looking at me. I turned my head to the side and saw Laura's head peering around the corner at me. Her eyes were dark and laced with hatred. It frightened me and I felt so confused as to why she was looking at me like this. I didn't want to cause any trouble so I didn't bring up Laura's death glares to my mother at all. Later that night, my uncle had joined us for dinner. He had stopped by to see how everything was with Laura and if we had had any luck finding her a place to live with one of her family members. After dinner, I was washing my plate in the sink when I heard a loud growling sound coming from the dining room. I turned my head to see Laura shaking and growling like some sort of wild animal. My mom and uncle looked disturbed and worried. Laura threw herself onto the floor and began thrashing around and screaming as if she were possessed. I was absolutely terrified. It was a scary thing to witness. I grew up very religious. My mom and uncle began praying out loud for Laura while I ran to the room and closed the door. This went on for two hours, but it felt like an eternity of horror. I could hear Laura screaming like a madwoman and growling like some sort of deranged beast. I don't think any of us knew exactly what was going on. After my mom and uncle had prayed for Laura for what felt like forever, Laura told us that she was free from an evil demon that had taken over her. None of us were sure what had caused her behavior. None of us were sure what had even happened. I peeked my head out of my room to see Laura smiling happily while she curled up on the couch with a blanket. Her eyes opened and she shot a cold glare at me. I quickly closed my bedroom door in fear. I placed a chair in front of the bedroom door and went to sleep. I woke up the next morning by my mom waking me up. She told me that she was taking me to eat at my favorite restaurant. When I asked her if Laura was going, she gave me a serious expression and spoke. Your uncle is going to take Laura back to her mom's house. He slept on the couch last night after what happened. He and I were talking when the two of you had gone to sleep and we pieced together that Laura made the entire performance up last night. She said, She's not stable and we think she's dangerous. As I heard my mother say those words, relief washed over me. I got dressed and went to the car to go to the restaurant with my mom. When we got into the car, we saw Laura and my uncle get in his truck with her. Laura looked angry. Her expression was of a child's when you don't give them what they want. She got into my uncle's car and they drove away. I'm 22 now and I have never forgotten about this horrific incident that happened in my life years ago. After that day, I never saw Laura or heard anything else about her ever again. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located on both Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.